the, the other thing you asked me right at the beginning was to list three reasons why mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that Muhammad, as he's depicted in the Sirah and the Hadith, is historical. And one of the primary reasons for that, and one of the reasons why this is not a nutty conspiracy theory, is that for the first nearly a century, and certainly for the first 60 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died, then you don't have anything about him and virtually no mention of him. There are a couple of scattered mentions here and there of Muhammad in non-Muslim literature. And then there's no Muslim literature about this whatsoever. And so you don't start to hear about Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, or Islam itself, or the Quran, until the begin late, the, the last decade of the, of the 600s and the early part of the 700s. And that is, Muhammad died in 632, so that's an extraordinary gap. If you compare, and this is another uh, useful thing to do, in the first place, though, I have to add the caveat that the situations are completely different. Muhammad may be completely fictional, and that doesn't have anything to do with the historical investigations of Christianity. Many, many people, when this with the first edition of Did Muhammad Exist came out, and I was going on radio shows and talking about it, so many radio hosts asked me, well, what about Jesus? Can't you say the same things about Jesus? And so I had to say, well, you know, in the first place, that's completely irrelevant because it's just two separate situations and they may have nothing to do with one another. But also it's a useful analogy because uh, the, the Lord Jesus died and rose from the dead in the early part of the 30s of the first century. So it's roughly analogous to Muhammad in 632 dying, 600 years before. And so if you look at the 30s, when Jesus dies and rises again, then you look at the 90s, 60 years later, you have the New Testament has been written, you have non-Christians speaking about the existence of Christianity and of churches, you have uh, churches all around the Mediterranean area, you have uh, uh, the post-Christian writers, Clement of Rome and so on, writing and uh, making reference to various uh, passages of the Christian of the New Testament. So you have a great deal of attestation of the existence of the Lord Jesus, a, a tremendous amount, much more than you have in the case of Muhammad, where just by contrast, in the year 638, 637, 638 thereabouts, the uh, Arab armies conquered Jerusalem. Now you would expect if this was six years after Muhammad, and if Muhammad was real, if Muhammad was the false prophet that David talks about, that if Muhammad had told us everything that we have now in the Hadith, that it was all spoken the way that it's depicted in the Hadith, that he said it all, and the Quran was all together, I mean all written, not collected together, but the, the entirety of the Quran, because after all it was revealed to Muhammad, so by 638, if the canonical story is true, then the Muslims have the Quran and they have this incredible wealth of material. It's an oral tradition, but that's not disqualifying because this was a time when people had, uh, when in oral cultures, people had prodigious memories. You know, Homer and the Greek bards, they memorized all of the Iliad and the Odyssey, no problem. And so, the uh, Hadith literature may have been all preserved orally, but it had to exist if, if it all comes from Muhammad. So in 638, because Muhammad said, and the Quran says to make war against the unbelievers and subjugate them and so on, they conquer Jerusalem. One would think that they're talking all about their prophet, all about their new religion, all about their holy book, because that's why they did this, right? And so there's a very famous story, a legendary story of Sophronius, the patriarch of Jerusalem, the, the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he meets Umar, the caliph, at the gates of Jerusalem and shows him around the city. 
and at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the church that houses the tomb of Christ, where he rose from the dead, Sophronius invites him in and says, go in and say a prayer. And Umar magnanimously and generously, graciously says, no, I won't go in and pray there. Because if I do, then my followers will claim it for a mosque and I'm going to leave this church for you Christians. That story is told to this day as an example of Islamic tolerance. However, that story also, like the Hadith, doesn't date from anything earlier than the ninth century. It's, it's, we only hear about it first in the 800s. In the 600s, though, we have writings of Sophronius himself. We have actually quite extensive writings of Sophronius himself. And in them, he never mentions Umar. He never mentions Islam. He never mentions the Quran. He never mentions Muhammad, even though he says that these invaders came, they laid waste to the churches, they sowed great havoc and destruction, they were God's judgment on the, the area. He, he speaks to a, a tremendous, at, at great length, about the theological meaning of the destruction of Christian Jerusalem. And nowhere does he say these people had a new religion or a new prophet or a new holy book. Now that's an extraordinary omission. If these people came in with the words of their new prophet ringing in their ears and their oral traditions about their prophet memorized and their Quran memorized, and they're very proud of their new religion, that it's the impetus for their conquest. Why don't they ever mention it? Why doesn't he seem, he doesn't even give any indication that he knows anything about it. And every other non-Muslim writer who encounters the invaders all through the seventh century has the same experience. They give no hint anywhere that they have this new religion. Mm. Now you contrast that with the, uh, the, the missionary travels of St. Paul, the formulation of the New Testament, the epistles, the establishment of churches in uh, Asia Minor and in Europe, there's nothing analogous to that. We have the conquests, but not, none of the, what is supposed to be the theological and ideological superstructure of those conquests. And I have um, a claim at least that um, somebody called uh, Thomas the Presbyter, who is, yeah. is apparently an early Syriac source and a Christian writer, um, dating to around 640, um, gives the earliest mention of Muhammad and tells us that his followers made a raid. Yes, Ibn Kabisa is from Tayyai. He is a Lakhmid king. He does have 30, he was given 30 um, villages by Kusrao, the Sassanian. He was a Sassanian to begin with. And then in 622, he then changes, moves over with the Arabs, and he is the one that has the agreement. And his nickname is Muhammad or Muhammad. That is his nickname. So it's obviously that Thomas of Presbyter is referring to him, not there the Muhammad of the ninth century. So Medina, and he, though, um, Medina, 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 he is way up in Hira, in what is today Kufa, just southwest of Baghdad. So he lives hundreds of miles further north, and he lives far to the east. He does. He is the one that introduces the the whole Arab identity because he then confronts the Sassanians who have been destroyed by Heraclius in 622. That's why 622 is so important because that's the beginning of this identity of the Arabs. Now he then, once he, has, once he has does that and brings this relationship with the Jews finally in place, that makes sense because remember, the seminaries for the Jews and the Christians are in Hira, where he grew up. So he was very much aware of that. More than likely, this Mahmet, who is from, from Tayyaye, he was a Christian. That, make, that is completely lost in the Islamic traditions. So the seventh century Muhammad was a Christian, not the one that we see in the traditions. And that's why we're saying you need to go with the evidence that's in the ground from the seventh century. That's what Robert's been doing since 2012. That's what I've been doing since 1995 when I first debated this with Dr. Jamal Badawi there at Cambridge University. Now, what's fascinating, I'm not going to go into all the, the material. I gave about 30 different areas where I think that we now have, we now have evidence. Uh, we, could go, we could go into all the rock inscriptions. None of them refer to Muhammad, yet they are from the, they're from the very time that Muhammad existed. I, we could go into the coins. The coins are probably the most damaging because the coins are, writ, are coined. They're minted by these Arab leaders 
in 620, 630, 640, 650, up until Mu'awiyah in 661. His coins are then minted. Nothing again, as Robert's been saying. There's nothing on any of these coins for someone named Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali. Their names don't appear. Yet they are, that's how you introduce yourself when you're a leader. You introduce yourself with coins. No, none of them are on those coins. Mu'awiyah is the first of the, what we would think of as a Muslim leader. But he has nothing to do with Islam. Because all of his coins in the east, which are silver, are all Zoroastrian. All of his coins in the west, which are gold and copper, are Christian. He's wearing a cross on his head. He's holding a cross in his hand. Why would a Muslim be holding a cross in his hand? Can you see that Kibbutz is not a Muslim? And he has, the, he has the star and the moon, which is a Sassanian royal power. That is a political symbol. That was Sassanian because he is he is inventing these coins in Iran, which is the Sassanian area. I thought your point in the debate with David was very uh, extraordinarily precise. It was a Moab of its own. If you want to find out about Jesus Christ, let's use his criteria. We must use that which comes two to three hundred years later that is embarrassing about Jesus Christ. Why don't you start with the infancy gospel of Thomas? Look at the infancy gospel of Thomas written in the second century. There is a Jesus that you would love to follow. This is a Jesus who a, he presents as a naughty, irresistible child, vindictive child, who uses his miraculous powers to take revenge on teachers, neighbors, and other children, some of whom he blinds, others he cripples, and he, he even kills. Is that the Jesus you want to take? Because that's the Jesus of the traditions, the Gnostic traditions that come 200 years later. Now, why were they not chosen by Arrhenius and the early church fathers? First of all, because they're too late. And secondly, that is not the historical Jesus we have from the first century. So, David, if you're going to use the idea of taking that which is later and more embarrassing for your criteria, then I want you to use, start using the infancy gospel of Thomas to now define your Jesus. Thank God that's not my Jesus. You notice this whole discussion today has been on whether Muhammad is embarrassing or whether Muhammad even existed. On both points, on both points, you can see there is a problem for Islam. Have you noticed... For Christians, there is no argument of embarrassment. There is no principle of embarrassment. Isn't it interesting that, you know, and for, for 40 years that I've been working with Muslims, I've always asked uh, them, well, they've always come to me, and they say, you know, we love Jesus. Why don't you love Muhammad? And my response has always been, exactly, there's the problem. Of course, everybody has a problem with Muhammad, but nobody has a problem with Jesus. Of course, you love Jesus. Who doesn't love Jesus? Even Madonna loves Jesus. I can't think of anybody that doesn't love Jesus because there's nothing embarrassing about him. There's nothing you can throw at him. There's nothing that, that, that dismerches his character. Everything Jesus does is as appropriate and as relevant today as it was the day he did it, 2,000 years ago. And who else can stand up to every criticism and even the historical criticism, as you so rightly said, Robert, we have gone through the historical criticism on Jesus for the last 150 years. We're way ahead of Islam in this historical problem. And that's the beauty of it. The historical critique, whereas it destroys Muhammad historically, it actually elevates Jesus historically. The Jesus of faith is the Jesus of history. The Muhammad of faith is nothing like the Muhammad of history. And that's the beauty of this whole discussion. When you come, when you do a like with like, I'm so glad that I don't have to defend Jesus on this. I'm so glad that there aren't Muslims out there sitting there slagging off Jesus. They can't. They dare. It's, he speaks for himself. He defends himself. And as far as I'm concerned, that's where the whole debate comes back down to.